from Austin, Texas. It's the Cube covering OpenStack Summit 2016. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation and headline sponsors Red Hat and Cisco. Now here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Brian Gracely. Welcome back to SiliconANGLE Media's production of theCUBE here at OpenStack Summit 2016 in Austin. Happy to have back on the program uh, two return guests. Uh, we've got Radesh Balakrishnan uh, with Red Hat, who was with us earlier in the week, and uh, first time this week, but been on the program uh, a few times before. Lou Tucker, who's the Vice President and CTO of Cloud Computing, Cisco. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here. Great. All right, so Radesh, we talked to you a little, a little bit earlier about kind of looking back and where OpenStack comes, so Lou, we need to get your thoughts. You've been involved, you know, since the earliest days, yes. uh, you know, here we are from 75 people uh, around the corner to 7,500. Yeah. You know, what's your impressions uh, for, for OpenStack and, and where it's gone? Yeah, well, I, it's, it's not a surprise. I think that, uh, you know, five, six years ago, we really saw, I think, an entire industry moving around the development of this kind of an open platform for anybody to, to build cloud. So uh, we were hopeful. Uh, we were, but it has been, a journey, but it's also been a very rewarding one because I think we've seen developers from around the world. Uh, we truly have global conferences now. So as cloud computing is spreading around the world, that we're seeing that OpenStack is the platform of choice for that. So it's been, it's been great to see that kind of adoption. Yeah, and, and Lou, I mean, you've been a big proponent of some of the open source initiatives inside mm -hmm. Cisco, mm -hmm. but open and networking is a big talking point, you know? Yeah. It gives us a little insight of kind of conversations inside of Cisco and how that's proliferating in the industry. Yeah. I think, again, over that same time period, <laughs> um, even Cisco has seen all of our customers asking for open platforms. They uh, want the industry to work together on these things. Before it was always driving standards. And so you could have standards and, and industry you know, leaders could agree upon the standards, but then there, wasn't a, then there were different software implementations. Now we're really looking for a common software implementation uh, that can build upon that. And that's affected Cisco, almost every part of Cisco's business. We're seeing that move towards open systems and the cloud. All right, so Radesh, I mean, Red Hat really understands how the open source things work. I, I used to work on some standards, and I used to work with Cisco on some standards, and you know, there, there was a you know, joke sometimes, it's like, well, Cisco would make something work, and eventually that would become the standard. So what's it like uh, partnering with Cisco and you know, their participation? How have they been coming along in the open source space? Yeah, so Lou was saying about the journey, so our partnership has also seen an amazing journey specific to OpenStack in the last two to three years, right? It's not that we were strangers before, of course, our partnership dates way back to the Linux days as well, but at the same time, from an OpenStack perspective, it's rewarding to see that across the multiple businesses within Cisco, you know, be it uh, public cloud from an inter-cloud perspective, or UCS, or NFV, or even the recently acquired Metapod uh, side, we have a, an amazing partnership across engineering as well as go to market to make sure that we are jointly pushing the boundaries of what OpenStack can do, as well as more customers can benefit from the solution. So it's been an amazing journey with Cisco. Yeah, so Luke, yeah. we've had a good uh, a, a chance to talk with Red Hat about the mm -hmm. solution they're building, how they're, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the OpenStack solution is. Uh, it's been about two years since uh, the InterCloud solution mm -hmm. uh, was launched. Give us the mm -hmm. update, what is it, how does it fit uh, yeah. in the environment, and what is the well, connection I with Red Hat? In, yeah. in many ways we're seeing a, um, many of Cisco's new businesses that we're entering, or either through acquisition, we're more and more we're seeing management moving to the cloud. And so Cisco's intercloud will be the place where we will start to see more and more management of infrastructure, uh, whether it be you know, on-premise and an enterprise or even a service provider. This kind of service delivery model from the cloud uh, is very compelling. Uh, it gives the best of both worlds because that way oftentimes companies don't have the expertise to manage their infrastructure. We can provide that service. So more and more we're seeing Cisco's own SaaS businesses moving <coughs> to intercloud and being able to be delivered from that. Yeah, I, I remember when you joined Cisco from, from Oracle back in about 2009, 2010, yeah, yeah. And, and at the time there was a lot of people who would go, you know, that, that Lou guy, he said some stuff and I have no idea what it means. You know, <laughs> he's talking about software. And they're and still saying open, that, I'm afraid. And, and all these sort of things. And I, I have to wonder, as you go jointly talk to customers, right, we're, we're now talking about, you know, blurred lines of who runs network and who runs compute and like, Talk about just kind of language-wise what it's like talking to customers now as you're talking about software, you're talking about open, you're talking about you know, managed yeah. cloud. Like, how has that evolved the last yeah. couple of years, especially you know, working jointly together? 
Well, I think I can start and then yeah, yeah. Sure. we I think a year ago it was a big, you know, awakening, I think, that we saw in the service providers space particularly, that they have large data centers and that this whole shift with SDN or towards virtualizing network functions, it becomes a cloud software issue. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they're looking and we're working very closely with Red Hat on this. They're looking for really where is the platform for, for OpenStack and then where can we get the virtualized network services that run on top of that. So we're collaborating and we see even in the user survey of OpenStack users or whatever, that the number one thing that they're interested in right now is containers, number two is NFV. That's, that's amazing. I, never I would not have predicted that. Yeah, five years ago, that, no way. That fast a change towards uh, networking and the virtualization of networking. Right, and, and how much do you, I mean, you guys work very closely on, on, on package solutions, making it easy to, whether you want it completely built for you or you know, it's best practices. How much demand do you see that from customers who are just go, look, I want to get to running things. I, I, I don't care so much about the underlying bits. I want them to be open, but how, much, how important is that for your customers? No, that is pervasive, right? So the reason we are aligned from an engineering perspective and contributing upstream together and looking at and reacting to demand signals, be it NFE and tomorrow there's a new uh, workload, is because customers by default have come to demand that the operational excellence that Cisco brings to bear, as well as the enterprise life cycle that Red Hat brings to bear, should be default, right, for the newer solution area. So that's the kind of the natural synergy that we are working to make sure that we are meeting the customer where they are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were essentially sort of the, one of the original OpenStack cheerleaders. You were, you were chair of the foundation mm -hmm. when it was just getting started, mm -hmm. uh, kind of mm -hmm. somewhat neutral. Somebody made a comment to us yesterday you know, this show is, it's obviously it's huge, uh, but a lot more suit, you know, maybe not as many suits as t-shirts, but, but kind of an interesting mix. Do you mm -hmm. guys feel like having been in this space for a long time, people questioned, you know, how do you make money? Are we, are we sort of at a tipping point where this becomes less about just technology and more about making these businesses happen? We saw so many customers this week. Um, yeah. Do you feel like we're I, hitting that point? Yeah, I ab absolutely do. I think we've seen a, a steady progression towards building out of a larger ecosystem. And, and when, when we talk about an ecosystem in technology, that is a set of companies that are being built around the platform. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Yesterday's platform, I mean, was Linux. It sort of started with Linux. And now we're seeing OpenStack being the platform that is a kind of an open integration place. Some of us on the foundation are talking about OpenStack's mission going forward is also to connect to a lot of other open communities so that we become this kind of open integration platform. So whether you're doing uh, containers or virtual machines, we have a lot of these services that allow it easily to integrate, which creates an opportunities for all of the companies that you see here today. So, I, and so I'm, I'm very pleased to see actually the, the growth of this into something that can be economically sustainable. And that's what I think an ecosystem is for, and that's what our customers are looking for. And from our perspective, you know, if you listen to our analyst call, Whitehurst would be calling out names, or if not names, the fact that some of the top deals that we do across the globe include OpenStack, right? The percentage is increasing every quarter, so we are well beyond the point of, hey, are we going to monetize? The question is, can we keep up the acceleration in monetization that right. we are seeing, right? Yeah. So, and that's yeah. where I think the partnership with Cisco mm -hmm. also comes into picture. Yeah. The reality is that, you know, the breadth of Salesforce that Cisco has and the level of trust relationship that Cisco has established across multiple uh, verticals, particularly in the service provider segment, is, uh, you know, is a great uh, uh, opportunity for us to make sure that OpenStack adoption is driven hard there. Yeah. And, and I think that, if I might add, the, the, the working together in the community upstream is what makes it all possible because it, it's, it's the way our developers want to work and that they have a natural synergy with other people who are in galvanized activity around a particular project. And that means that we can simultaneously do the two things which are most difficult. One is improve the stability, performance of the platform, reliability, while we continue to expand into new areas. Yeah. There's always that tension, and the only way you can do it, and I've managed engineering teams for a long time, is to really have multiple teams that are, one, some that are really looking towards that kind of 
resiliency of the platform, while others are looking for, okay, what are the new things that we can do? Uh, getting that timing right is really critical. That's the hardest thing to do in, in tech, I think, is timing, timing the market transitions, timing the introduction of new technologies. Yeah, if I could add to that, I mean, we kind of see uh, what in, we internally refer to as a fast train customer and a slow train customer, <laughs> yeah. right? With customers with slightly different <laughs> needs in terms of what they expect from that. But as leaders, we need to be able to address the needs of both the camps, right? So that's the ongoing challenge that we are on, right? Yeah. right. Okay, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the Metapod solution that came from sure. the MetaCloud acquisition? How, how's that look going forward uh, from a partnership standpoint? Uh, that's, that's really going well, and it's, it's actually not that um, of a surprise because, in fact, deploying and operating OpenStack is not, is not a skill that every enterprise has. So particularly in the enterprise spaces where they would like to get the benefits of cloud computing, of public cloud, cloud computing, but they have a requirement to run it on premise. And uh, that means that they want it delivered as a service on premise. So we think of it as delivering OpenStack as a service on premise for the customer. So they get to have the benefits of, of running on top of a cloud without having to worry about the infrastructure. They consume it like a service. So it's a very interesting model. I think that we'll see, I mean, not only Cisco, there are other players also looking to see, you know, uh, yeah. for those kinds of opportunities. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious just, uh, and please, please feel free to uh, discuss yeah. it too, but also, I mean, you know, you take your typical Linux admin or network admin, and you know, there's definitely a shift coming in place. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe we could talk a little bit of dynamics, you know, who, you know, helps make the purchasing decision and what happens uh, from some of the internal uh, pieces of yeah. that. Yeah, so there's always going to be a set of customers who would graduate from having to manage servers to you know, having to manage cloud, right? Yeah. In fact, we are excited about the fact that just last uh, calendar year, 10,000 um, IT professionals across the globe uh, went through training of our OpenStack platform offering. Wow. But at the same time, to Lou's point, there is uh, an emerging set of customers who would like to get the benefits of OpenStack from an agile infrastructure, as well as from the freedom from vendor lock-in that OpenStack promises, but amidst the priorities that they have, they don't have the wherewithal to invest resources. So that's where I think Metapod becomes an amazingly compelling value proposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, interesting, uh, you know, I'd say there are sometimes criticism out in the community, Cisco and even Red Hat, that mm -hmm. there is some, you know, a little bit of lock-in despite the fact that there's open source. I'm curious, how, how do you address that and what, what are the real conversations you have with users it, it, on it? It's a great question because I think um, there's always such a thing as natural lock-in and that is what you have familiarity with, that's what you've, you've been used to, you get comfortable with that. You don't want to swap you know, in systems in and out so fast that you really can't get the experience with it. So that, that I don't view as a negative. I view that as a natural um, way that we, we operate businesses today. What we're trying to avoid is unnecessarily locking in a customer, giving them no other choice. So by the fact that we have an open platform with OpenStack, it forces all of us as vendors to compete for the customer's business and the customer gets to standardize on OpenStack and insulate themselves and, and, and really create, I think, the, the proper pressure back into the environment for this. Yeah, so yeah, from our perspective, you can look at it as technology lock-in versus value lock-in. Technology lock-in is something we definitely will do everything to make sure it doesn't happen. That's by doing one simple thing, which is doing everything upstream first. Mm -hmm. The value lock-in, to lose point can happen anytime because of the fact that you're used to engaging with a particular provider, the value that the vendor is providing on a consistent basis, et cetera. Now, given our subscription business model, we're on an annual pace where every year we got to go eyeball to eyeball with the customer and earn the trust all over again, right? So we, I think, have solved the problem from our perspective saying that, hey, look, Totally, up, uh, even if you acquire a company which is a proprietary code base, we'll you know, do the due, due diligence and ultimately make sure that it's upstream and made available, right? So the technology lock-in problem, take it off the table. The value lock-in is something that we want to earn every single day, um, um, you know, coming to work and making sure that the customer journey is supported. Yeah, but both of you have big events coming up later on, Cisco Live and in Red Hat mm -hmm. Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, without, without giving away the punchline, mm -hmm. give us something that people can be excited about beyond OpenStack Summit that you guys you know, expect to have you know, driving the summer and, and something to look forward to for, for those types of things. I can go first. Yeah, uh, yeah, so right at away. Red Hat Summit, clearly the graduation from infrastructure to more the application-centric journey with containers as a core focus will be a key thing. 
we're excited about the fact that we do have a full-fledged offering that's based on you know, community adopted Docker, Kubernetes as standard, so how do we enable customers on this digital disruption is going to be the key theme there. So we're you know, looking forward to not just the customer's the next step in the journey, but our, our own organizational next step in the journey of maturing from being an infrastructure provider to becoming a trusted advisor in the new scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah, I think that what we're seeing at each one of these events is that continued sort of digitization that is happening. Um, we're far from complete. Yeah. And so that creates always great new use cases, customer examples, and everything else as company after company is getting further along in that process. Uh, we're also now intersecting, I think, the world of IoT so that a lot of more of the growth in devices and everything else is creating, is creating other pressures that again, pushes then much more towards cloud native computing. The applications, and we've talked I think before in, in previous shows about that the application landscape is going to really start to shift next, I think, where we're seeing applications that are built right from the start for the cloud. That gives them very different characteristics. That gives them a resiliency beyond what we've seen before, and it gives them a scale. And so I think as more and more, you'll see coming out, I think, more and more cloud native applications coming out and that you'll see our companies participating in that. That's great. I want to give each of you the, the last word on kind of takeaways from the week, maybe you know, something good you've heard from a customer, or you know, uh, things mm -hmm. that we should think about going forward. Pradesh? Excited about the progress we've made together as community. Even more excited about the partnership that Cisco and Red Hat have uh, uh, struck and you know, grown along the last few years that we have meaningful offerings across, you know, like I, I was saying, ranging from public cloud all the way to NFE and telco opportunities. Um, I think we touched upon the fact that pervasive adoption is the next step in the journey uh, from an OpenStack perspective, so looking forward to meeting again and uh, comparing notes on that. Yeah. I think I'm just uh, most pleased by the the sort of universal acceptance that open source and open source communities are the wave of the future. And that we are now seeing the adoption, we're seeing this is now accepted, and that we're seeing then you know, conferences such as this, which is actually a mixture of a design conference where developers are getting together with actually a big marketplace here where people are making deals. And that kind of growth, I think, is, is a real tribute to, to the power of what we have in, in open source today. Radesh and Lou, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to catch up with you. Be sure to check out siliconangle.tv for all the upcoming events where theCUBE is coming around, especially the spring tour. We'll be right back, uh, getting towards the end of three days of coverage from the OpenStack Summit 2016 in Austin. You're watching theCUBE. It's always fun to come back to theCUBE because you know, the, the discussion is always interesting and relevant. It's not scripted, uh, which I think makes it real, and I think it's really good service for